Hey everybody, it's Paul Yeager, and this is the MTOM Show podcast, a production of Market to Market and Iowa PBS. One of the long-standing traditions of Market to Market is the market analysis segment, and we pride ourselves on a variety of analysts to give you perspective on what's happening in the grain markets. You've come to know many over the years, maybe some are new, and today we are going to bring in a new voice uh, to just give you something else to think about. You know, you watch the show, but now here is somebody different. Sean O'Leary has started a company in Iowa, in, hog, in, uh, in ag country, called Hawkeye Commodity Brokers. He's not a cyclone, but he is a Hawkeye. We'll talk about the difference there and uh, how he made his start, how his dad used to talk to him about the business and his eyes would roll back in the back of his head. Funny how life sometimes goes. That's our discussion today. If you have any feedback for me, it's paul.yeager at iowapbs.org. I always look forward to hearing from you. If you feel like a comment, those are kind of fun too. Sean, how does a guy in agriculture feel he's strong enough to make Hawkeye the first part of his uh, company name? Doesn't that get you in trouble in cyclone country? It, it does, especially this year. Uh, I, I've been kind of quiet this year, uh, rightfully so, uh, with all due respect to another fine school is kind of how I put it. I think we're, uh, very fortunate to have two very fine schools. Um, you know, I, I, I went to Iowa, but, uh, had all kinds of friends that went to Iowa state. So I, I knew, I knew I was potentially getting into it when I, when I named the company the way I did, but, uh, it's a cyclone state this year. It's been a Hawkeye state. It's, uh, two great schools in one great state though. The, you grew up in the shadow of cyclone country. Carroll is not that far from Ames. You share highway 30 right there. Uh, you mentioned a lot of friends that went there. What went into your decisions between schools? I have no idea if you were looking at maybe a small school and decided on Iowa instead. Yeah, I I uh, I jokingly say that Iowa, the Iowa City was further away from home, and at the time they had a better football team. That's kind of how I thought as a high school senior, unfortunately. But it is what it is. I also had, <laughs> truthfully, I had two older sisters that attended the University of Iowa, graduated from there, so okay. we had a little bit of a pedigree going at that school at that time. And you weren't studying agriculture at the time either. You went for a different major. I did. I did. I was an open major to start, uh, went into broadcasting and film, which uh, you'll appreciate, I'm sure. So, you know, I got to school, didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, uh, went into that field, um, moved back home to Carroll while I was looking for a job. And I said to my dad, he, he asked me, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I, I'm open to a lot of things, but I, I want to work for a, a good sized company that's at the head of their field. And he said, well, the company I work for is at the head of their field. Dad, I didn't know that. You know, he had spent years while I was in grade school and high school trying to explain to me what it was he did. And it always made my eyes roll to the back of my head. I had no idea what he was talking about. Uh, but uh, started with him, and, and the company was Lind, Lind Waldock, and they were eventually sold in 2000, but they were the first and, and eventually the largest discount brokerage in the country. And uh, I, I fell in love with it from day one, and very intriguing industry to be in, always challenging. Well, you have to fill me in. What exactly is a discount brokerage? What's that mean? Well, at the at the time that was in you know eighty nine and ninety when I started, that's when everything was uh, traded open outcry in the pit, so nothing done electronically, uh, and of course discount today means something entirely different. But we had customers that all they wanted was execution. They they knew what they wanted to do. They just needed someone to do it for them. Uh, where, where Lynn Waldock really had an in was they were the first to transmit orders electronically 
from a trade desk like ours in Carroll, Iowa, to to uh, just outside the pit. The order was brought in by a runner, executed by a broker, reported electronically back. So they were uh, night and day different in in the way of execution. So they they got things done quickly and they did them well. And uh, it, it was a great company to work for. Great company. Ted Seifert talks about his time working on the floor as a runner, as an intern, and he would be yeah. one of those runners of the trades. Did you ever aspire to go into Chicago and, and work on the floor? I, I did. I did. And I actually uh, uh, was kind of invited to do so. But at the time, I had uh, two small kids uh, living in Carroll. And it, it, I saw it as kind of a daunting thing, someone in my uh, position. And I kind of, I, I jokingly said the whole time I was in Carroll that, uh, you know, I like Carroll a lot. And it, it's especially nice when you can make Chicago money and not live in Chicago. So I, I, I kind of fell back on that for a long, long time, yeah. Well, there's something about the Chicago way and the rural way of, you know, Carroll is a town, but it still is not a suburb of Chicago. It is different. Exactly. But you're still involved with the, the the commodities, the communication side. Did did you ever? Do you feel like that was a, a major? That how did that help you? I won't say wasted because I'm a communications major, so I can't say mom that my major was wasted. But uh, how is it that that has helped you? do what you do now. Yeah. Well, it's, it's all about communication. Uh, you don't, in a lot, in a lot of ways, I, I kind of feel like I came into the industry and in, into finance with kind of a blank slate, which can be an advantage. I, I didn't have anything, uh, ingrained in me that was going to potentially be problematic. And, when it comes to opening accounts uh, at that time, uh, we were opening accounts for, you know, we had all kinds of customers. Any Anybody that was successful in their field and could afford to open an account to trade futures and options, they they came to us. So we had, we had farmers, we had grain and livestock producers, obviously, but we had doctors, dentists, attorneys, real estate uh, people, hotel, restaurant owners, you name it. And uh, the communication side of it really came in into play there. I think if you have uh, good oral and written communication skills, you can go a long ways, whether you're in in the finance side or or any other industry. So I, I think it paid off in that regard. Because in a way, you have to explain uh, what is a complex philosophy of buying something in the future that you don't physically own for a delivery that you won't take, but I might take to not scare the bejesus out of somebody. Yeah, yeah. And my dad was a very patient person when he tried to explain all that to me <laughs> when I first started. Ex except you said it ro you rolled your eyes in the back of your head. So he 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 needed it, to put it because that whole explain it to me like I'm a fourth or a fifth grader. He yeah, father and son is different than than a customer. Took months, maybe years. Yeah, yeah. And then maybe it's easier when it's not a father and son, right? <laughs> but yeah, it's uh and you know the the uh what, what I like about the futures and options side of it, the futures are, you can eventually kind of explain that to anyone. You're, 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 you're selling something you don't own, but it's a promise to buy it back. And if you don't do so, this happens and you want to avoid that. But it's the options side of it that, that really interests me. And I think uh, producers could could really do themselves a lot of good by by educating themselves or becoming educated uh, about what's possible on the option side of it. Because if you if you start with futures and then throw in long puts and or long calls, you've scratched five percent of the surface. Honestly, there is a a world of uh, opportunities in between those two 
two uh, categories. So, and I, I tell people when I, I make trade recommendations to both spec and hedge customers, I said, you know, the, the only way to really learn how to do it is to actually do it. And you can, um, it, it's kind of like a measurement of an inch. Is it an, exactly an inch or is it just over or just under? And you can keep slicing and adding zeros after that decimal. You can do the same with the option market as well. When your father in his company, uh, I'll ask in a moment about how the customer has changed, but let's let's button up how you got involved with what your dad was doing and then transferred into your own operation. Right. Well, uh, the uh, the discount side of it eventually towards the towards the end of the '90s, early 2000. Some people will remember, others won't, but. It was kind of a race between the CME and the, and the CBOT as far as which electronic platform would win out. The Board of Trades was initially called Project X or Project A. Uh, the uh, CME had their own matching system and they called it Globex. Well, we all know which of those two won out. And the CME basically uh, you know, they, they they kind of incorporated the Board of Trade over time. So at the end of, uh, uh, or, or starting in the early 2000s is when everything became more and more electronic. Lynn Waldock was sold to Refco. You know, uh, some will remember Refco uh, out of Sioux City, Iowa. They filed for bankruptcy in 2005. There was uh, they cook the books on an IPO. So Lynn Waldock, a great company to work for, got sold to, as someone put it, the dirtiest firm on the street. And we found out a few a handful of years later that was indeed the case. Uh, so we we went from from being a, a, a branch of Lynn Waldock to a branch of Refco. Refco was bought by a firm eventually known as MF Global. MF Global filed for bankruptcy in 2011. And that at the time was one of the top 10 bankruptcies in, in the US. And uh, there were, uh, the, those weren't pleasant times, let me put it that way. But uh, after MF Global filed for bankruptcy, uh, we, went over to RJ O'Brien as our clearing member. We became an introducing broker at that time, no longer just a branch office of a large corporation. So we've been incorporated as Hawkeye Commodity Brokers since 2011. And so that was, and, and was your dad done at that time working? Dad uh, passed away at age 72 in I think uh, 2006. So he had stepped out of the business. Um, and uh, it was uh, my brother Mark and I and, and another order entry clerk. And uh, that was the case until uh, we we moved into uh, home offices in, in 2016. I, my wife and I moved to, to Des Moines in 2019. We've got two adult sons here in the metro. I've got a daughter that's a pharmacist in Iowa City and our youngest is a daughter works in TV production in, in Dallas, Texas. So uh, we, we enjoy enjoy where we are now. She's gonna critique this interview, isn't she? If, if I didn't get the lighting right on you? You know, even if this interview didn't take place, she'd be critiquing me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I didn't hear a next generation involved in what you're doing. They are not, they are not. Uh, they, the, uh, the older son is, a is a contractor. The other works, uh, for a, a friend here in town in manufacturing and, uh, the daughters are Iowa city and, and Dallas. I've, uh, I think they're smart enough to not go into this business. Well, okay. You, you mentioned you're in the home. Uh, does that make it easier to get up at three in the morning to start reading through, uh, the overnights? Interesting you should say that because um, I, you know, 
you had someone uh, on the other day that I, uh, you asked him about, uh, I don't recall who it was, doesn't really matter, but 3 a.m. came up at, in, in the conversation and, and I thought, you know, I remember when all that started and, and we'd have customers complain, you know, our, our especially grain customers. They say, you know, I, I don't like this overnight trade. You know, it just, it, it doesn't sit well with me. And, you know, I would explain that the market's going to be open and moving somewhere when it's not here. It's, it's not going to just wait around. And you'll remember during open outcry and prior to that night trade uh, coming about, you'd have gap open moves at 9.30 central time and people would just got to get their bell rung, you know? And you can get your bell rung a different way now. Um, but going back to the, the option side of it and, and how you can take control of the markets, I, I tell people when you learn how to use the options, and again, not just buying puts and, and buying calls, that's just the start of it. When you can learn how to use the option market to protect uh, a different position, uh, including a futures position, you can go to bed at night and know that you're not going to get your bell rung. You know, you might you might be limiting yourself in potential profit, but I think there's a trade-off. You know, if you don't sleep well, you're not going to work well the next day. Well, and that's you know, I was going to ask. We'll come back to the how the customer has changed. Now the customer can get updates from whomever, whenever about any movement during the course of the day or at night. So what you're saying is if you take a little bit of work, spend a little bit of money to find a position and create a, a, a safe spot for you, a strike or a, a sell point, sleep is a little easier to have than, but, but producers, I'm guessing some of your customers have had some very sleepless nights. How do you talk them back from, Hey, help me out. Let me help you here. Yeah. You yeah. Sleep. Well, there's uh, and and there is only so much you can do and 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 obviously there's a distinction between a hedger and a speculator. You know the the hedger uh, has skin in the game. The hedger, unless he's completely hedged, is is is, is going to have a, a blow softened by the fact that he's he's got inventory that is not yet priced. Uh, so. That, that's that's one way to look at it. But but honestly, there's only so much you can do when you're talking about uh, long or short futures going into a night session. Mm -hmm. you're, uh, um, you're, you're, you're just kind of at the mercy of what's going to happen globally and how money chases money. And uh, that 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 game never sleeps. Perfect transition to the wheat market. What do you see in 2023 with the global money and the global story? Uh, because wheat has become a, a, an absolute global commodity because it's grown in so many places. But when you have major global stories impacting the one side of the ledger, how does uh, how do you see wheat in 23? Well, going into it uh, and, and looking at the past uh, just a few weeks of trade, uh, it, it's... You know, if, if you're an end user, I'd say you're not in a hurry to cover cover needs right now, uh, the way it's looked. And Russia had a big crop, Canada year over year, big increase in production. France, uh, I read the other day, was 98% good to excellent rating. I know ours going into dormancy is uh, not in good shape, but if you throw all those things together, uh, I, I'd say you can afford to be patient. Uh, but putting in new lows here recently, uh, and I think depending on the contract, we're, we're close to $2.50 or two sixty dollars off of the highs from the spring and early summer. That, that's a big move. That's a, that's a big chunk taken off value-wise of that market. So I think that would be, uh, that would be something somebody could 
could uh, be interested in the, the long side of that going into next year. Yeah, Sue Martin said on the show recently, she said, if you've waited to sell now, why not keep waiting? Because you might get it to bounce back. You've missed your opportunity, the $2 uh, that right. you're referencing there. Right, right. Uh, in corn, uh, that is a, a fundamental story uh, that, that circles around a, a global demand for the crop. And there's always the C word, the China hanging out over our head. Were you surprised China has been buying so much U.S. corn? Um, I would say no, and they're, they're, they're pretty good about buying it at the right time. You know, I think you can say that with the soybean market as well. And, uh, uh, I, I think you could probably look for that to continue. We've got, I, I, I'm sure they know the, they know the balance table is pretty tight too, and it, it won't take much of a hiccup in production for that to uh, be exacerbated. So I, I think you could look for that to continue and they haven't been, you know, with, with COVID and, and the way they've treated lockdowns, they haven't been exactly, uh, uh, moving forward as they typically would economically. So I think there might be, you might see some, some pent up demand, whether it's corn or bean or bean oil and, and meal. Uh, so and that could spill over into the hog market as well. Do you see a, uh, a, an acreage fight that makes it pretty much 50-50 in the United States corn soybeans? Do you see the ratio changing in 23? Uh, I would say I would say it would favor the bean market right now. Uh, but that's going to depend on what happens in South America, obviously. Always a caveat, right? And... Um, that I think for the most part, you know, people have been looking for for big numbers out of both Brazil and Argentina. Argentina has been on the dry side. I think Brazil generally has been uh, pretty benign. But I would think price wise going into next year, uh, we're, we're going to see a lot of producers looking at maybe planting more beans compared to corn. Do you get in the camp like Matt Bennett does? American farmer sure likes to plant corn and will plant it if there's even a slight chance that it's a better option for him. Yeah, I think there's probably some truth to that. Probably some truth to that. Do you see price highs coming for the year in the first six months of 23 in corn? Uh, I would say uh, the way it looks to me, um, I. I would expect to see highs made in beans sooner than corn. And that's basically just the way it looks on a chart for the time being. Beans have, have really held their value. They're kind of pushing the upper end of the range. Uh, meanwhile, corn's just kind of fall, fallen out of the bottom side of the range. And obviously corn's not getting any help from the wheat market, so. Yeah. Uh, you've been, you keep bringing beans into the conversation. I suppose we should talk about that a little bit. What is it you like about soybeans? You mentioned chart uh, movement. Is that what gets you excited or is there a fundamental side to beans that gets your attention? Yeah, I'd say it's a little bit of both. And I'll, I'll admit to being more of a tech technician as opposed to a, a, a fundamental uh, analyst. I do, uh, I do a fair amount of reading, but I try to kind of cap it because eventually it'll just cloud your judgment. So, uh, you know, I, I think if you, uh, if you look at kind of some, some macro things, um, I would throw the, the crude oil market out there as one thing. Uh, we, we just put in a new low yesterday. Uh, I've got some customers that are, you, you, they're, they're grain and livestock producers. Some of them will step in on the long side of the crude and, and call it a, a hedge. Sometimes it is, sometimes it really isn't. But I had, I had one, uh, one customer yesterday say, why, why does the market keep putting in new lows? And I said, well, I, I think that's an indication that, you know, the, uh, politically and worldwide, uh, people are a little bit fearful of, of how the early part of next year, first, second quarter 
are going to play out. If uh, if you see more confidence in uh, economies, both locally and globally, you're not going to see crude oil putting in new contract lows. So I think that should be that that to me kind of throws up a red flag about how how things are now, but but also how they might be going forward. So, so maybe maybe the global story or the the stories uh, in the last six months, three to six months of uh, a recession's coming, a downturn's coming, and the crude oil market not responding as such. Now that the you're telling me, it sounds like that the market is telling us something. The crude oil market specifically is is telling us that maybe there's not as much confidence about the economy real soon, real fast. I I, I would say that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. And if you, you know, if I had to choose uh, corner beans for someone to be long, I think that's why beans look that much better. Uh, corn is kind of mirroring the crude oil and the fact that uh, at least in the recent weeks, it's it's moving lower, whereas the bean market is kind of inching higher. If the bean market is inching higher in the face of crude oil putting in, in new lows, that's a that's a bullish sign for the bean market. Yeah. All right, in the last couple of minutes here, let's get into some livestock talk. Uh, how much do you look at? What do you like about? We'll start with beef. You like live cattle or feeders uh, as a, an investment? If I'm not somebody in the feedlot necess- necessarily. Yeah, I you know in in cattle the the last cattle on feed was you know we 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 have a small herd. Uh, the talk is that production first and quarter, second quarter of next year is going to be lower, not drastically, but lower. And the way that market is traded, it, it just seems to always get bought on a dip. It seems to hold value. I've got uh, cattle producers that are kind of fearful of what happens in the equity market and the talk of recession and the like. And you, you just never really see it play out in the price of cattle. Uh, traditionally, you'd think there'd be a, a, a correlation, and there has been, between a weak equity market and people stepping away from, from high price beef. But I think what the consumer has told us over the past um, six to 12 months is that even if the equity market's poor, we're still gonna eat well. And then they have not stepped away from from high price beef, so I think that's uh, that's encouraging if you're if you're a cattle producer, and hopefully that'll can continue to be the case. Yeah, as you see the, uh, the, the 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 holdback finally maybe some holdback in those feeder uh, markets where in the in those yards where you're like, okay, I think we can finally afford as corn has dropped a little bit and some of the input sides. Uh, hog market, you kind of mentioned a little bit about. Uh, uh, the, uh, earlier in our conversation, do you like mm-hmm. hogs in the first part of 23? I do. Um, I think right now, seasonally, we're we're getting to a point where we have uh, typically a, a pretty good supply. Uh, if you look at the summer months, I think those have outperformed. Uh, they outperformed the October. They've outperformed the December contract. And right now, they're outperforming the February. So I think that's encouraging and that market, I, I can't really, I, I wouldn't be able to explain why, but that uh, under a handful of times, but over the past six to nine months has had some sharp sell-offs, you know, 12, 14, $15 in a short amount of time. And you think, well, that's it. You know, we're, we've, you know, the worm has turned and we're, we're headed lower. Two weeks later, we're back to the same value or or even greater, and that that's happened again recently, with uh, both the nearby and the deferred contracts. So, I think that's that's a a friendly indicator. And I, I mentioned China and and how they haven't been uh, they haven't been your typical China with the way they've treated lockdowns. So, if yeah. they get that figured out, I think that could be friendly for a lot of things. All right, I guess I didn't prep you for this one, but if you had to pick one contract, one commodity that you like in the first six months of 2023, Mr. O'Leary, what would it be? Long wheat. And I'm 
I, I, I'm not, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put a customer into corn and beans four times faster than I will the wheat market. Um, not a lot of wheat grown in Iowa. I don't, I don't have a lot of wheat producing customers. Uh, but I think that, um, if you compare the way that looked in the spring to the way it looks right now, that's a, that's a pretty depressed market. Not a lot of reason to get excited about a depressed market. That's one way to look at it. But you know, taking two to two fifty or two sixty uh, off of that contract, I don't see we going down another dollar, dollar fifty, two dollars. So I think that's uh, even from a short covering standpoint, that's that's got some some potential pop to it. You might say smells potential. I love it. Also love the way wheat smells in the morning too. John O'Leary <laughs> from Des Moines, Iowa. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And yeah, uh, I appreciate it too. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. My thanks to Sean O'Leary for his time and commentary and how he sees markets moving in 2023, at least for the first few months. If you have any thoughts or feedback for the program, you can also send an email to market to market at iowapbs.org. I'm Paul Yeager. Thanks for watching, listening, or reading. We'll see you next time.